Hello friends. So welcome you all to the 23rd session. So in this section we are going to see an actual implementation of a floating point processor ok. So we saw the floating point format in the last class. So this this is going to introduce you to the actual implementation of a floating point processor which is actually a family of you know part of uh, ARM family and this is uh, one of the co processors that can be connected to the ARM while building the system ok. If uh, you are interested in adding the floating point capability to the chip that we are making ok. So here I am going to you know briefly talk about the is you know different architecture classification and where does SIMD come where does it belong to and then what is the vector processor a brief very brief introduction because <coughs> since we are going to talk about vector floating point processor, uh, processor uh, it is logical to you know make you aware about these vector processors and their advantages. Then we will go into the details of uh, implementation of EFP and how we will see one example of um, implementation a floating point uh, it is not an, a complete application but a, a small implementation which will show you the different features of EFP ok. So the architecture the processor architecture classification actually um, given by a very you know 1965 uh, time scale this was done and later processors they fall into different categories now but this classification done by Dr. Michael Flynn uh, actually gives you a broader view of where a particular processor belong to ok. So this is called taxonomy that is a branch of science concerned with the classification especially of organisms but here we are using it for processor architecture and these are the four broad categories any processor if you see in the world they will fall under one of the categories ok. So let us see what they signify. So SISD is a single instruction and single data stream. That means a CPU is there, ok, a memory. So it accesses a stream of instructions, and based on what the instruction wants, it accesses the data also, and then the processing continues, ok. So this is the processing processor which executes instructions, and this is the control unit which controls the signals to the memory and how. Uh, instructions and data are accessed and then the data stream gets the all the required data from the memory and they process on them. So if you see that a single processor ok it gets one instruction stream coming into the processor and one data stream and it operates on them right. So this is what is called a single instruction and single data stream processor any uni processor including our processor arm falls under this category ok. Now what is SAMD this is what actually we started off because the vector processors the vector floating point processor falls under this category. So what is the difference between that and this here the instruction stream that is coming from the memory ok is fed to multiple elements processing units ok or we call as processing element. So if you see there are n processing elements here and all of them get the same instruction stream, but they get different data streams they tend they happen to work on different set of data. So Though it is shown here as LM, M1 and M1 and different memory block, 
they all for can be kept in a single memory physical memory itself okay it is not that they need to be separate uh, physical memories but they get different data that is the main indicator you know, uh, thing which you should uh, keep in mind but they all get the same instruction. So, what you get you will get a results which are equivalent to number of processing elements in the system. So, if there are n processing elements and uh, this instruction whatever you is being performed is an addition suppose and if it takes uh, let us assume that it is a floating point addition and it is working on n set of data n elements are there in uh, processes ok. So, you get after n maybe this take takes 3 cycles assume after 3 cycles how many results will be available n results will be available because all of these processing elements run in parallel. So, that is very important because we cannot keep a processing element and they do not run in parallel then there is no use. So, all the processing elements are running in parallel. So, they get the instruction and all of them operate on different data and give you a different set of results. So, that is uh, this is a multiple processing element. So, it is need not be multiple processes in a sense it could be multiple aid add arithmetic units ok ALU may be multiple A add units may be there ok and then they each of them will be getting a different that set of data may be you know if you need to add you need at least 2 inputs and then they each add units give you output. So, the processing elements can be mapped to a uh, add unit in ALU or may be a multiplication unit. So, there can be multiple units in the system and they all operate in parallel ok. Okay, so this is what is SAMD and the vector floating point processor fall under this category, falls under this category. And another difference here: multiple instruction and single data stream. So what we saw earlier was single instruction and multiple data stream, and this is the reverse of that. What does it mean? You get different instructions to the units, okay? But the same same data. Uh, when I say same data means it could be modified by this element and then the modified data stream will come, but if you consider this whole thing as a single system there is only one data stream coming into the system and then multiple processing units may be pass on this same data may be modified based on this instruction and then a different set of instruction will be operating on it and then the data element gets changed and then it goes out. A typical example is a network processor where assume you have a router ok a network router and then there is a input packets coming in and then there are so many output ports maybe input ports also many will be there output ports there are so many so many those packets may go into one of them. Now, while these packets are getting routed if you have a networking background then you will know that some of the packets may get changed also because based on the you know L2, L3, L layers maybe L2 layer will have the addresses different because here the network is different from what network this packets come through and then as as per the L3 maybe in internet protocol there may be some changes to the packet happening you know you you must be knowing that you know time to live is one of the element based on the number of hop element hop uh, nodes the packets the entry in the TTL may be changed. So, what I am trying to say is the packets which get routed to different networks they get changed maybe at some level in L2 level or maybe a packet uh, data in the L3 level. So, and then the processing also may work on maybe this will work on L2 layer data and then this may work on L3 layer and this may do an encryption which may fall under the higher categories and some elements may do a uh, modification in the some layers. So, different operations are performed on the same packet before the packet goes out. So, it is a typical example ok and then a very high level parallelism is called multi level multiple instructions and multiple data stream where you have multiple processing elements connected to network or you know it could be in the same uh, physical location, but they all work on there they have their own local memory or they could be a shared memory. So, it could be a distributed uh, system or a shared memory system where 
each of the processing elements gets different data stream as well as different instruction stream they work on different part of the data and then but they all work on a single application ok, but they may do a different jobs which all combine together to achieve an application goal. So, they all run in parallel they all work on different set of data and different set of instructions are running on them. So, this is called multiple instruction and multiple data stream this is the network of workstation may fall under this category ok. So, this just to give you a overview and then let us see what is SAMD processor SAMD processor and the name is a vector processor or it could be called as array processor and it runs multiple operations or a single add operation on multiple data ok simultaneously that is very important and it is common it was common in 1970s and 1990s as a super computer we call them a super computer, but now whatever the home desktop we have they also may do lot of jobs in parallel. So, and uh, all the pieces that we have is all multi core processors, so they, they will be running in parallel. So, now that they were these are 1970s, 90s, they even having um, the vector processor was a uh, considered to be a super super computer. So, operates on vector of data. So, one example I can give you is a matrix, ok. Suppose you have n rows, ok. N and m column so n by m matrix and then you want to multiply it by another no matrix maybe m by p okay so when you want to do this kind of operation matrix multiplication or matrix addition of no n by n matrix plus another n by n matrix if you want to add i'm sorry about the squares what i see okay n by n now what happens the each element here needs to be added to this element here ok. So, we can take a particular row and then a particular row here and then add them all. So, these operations which are happen done on a matrix ok they operate on different data, but the intent either it is a multiplication or addition that interest in instruction is single. So, basically a vector processor is to operate on matrix of data or a vector of data. So, vector of data is a maybe a single row or a single column element can be considered as a vector of data and then e corresponding elements are act no operated on either a multiplication operation or addition operation or any other operation that we want to scaling or no uh, rotation of matrix anything can be done. Uh, so, transformation all these kind of a matrix operation fall under this vector data. So, uh, an example is suppose I showed you that uh, matrix of data suppose we fill in those you know, different data each vector elements are having some memory and then we give feed different data in the matrix and then another set of vector processors they also get a new uh, elements a row of elements then they all can do a you know, parallel uh, addition and then the results could be stayed in another vector. So, typically in a scalar operation one data you know if in an addition operation it is a you no know, two day set of you know one set of data is taken and then the result comes out. So, whereas in case of a vector processor a vector of data is taken ok. So, these two are input and then the output is given. So, that means depending upon number of elements in the vector or number of processes that are running in parallel that many uh, the parallelism will be that suppose n processes are there you get a L n additions or subtractions or whatever will be done in a single cycle or it could be if addition takes 3 cycles in a 3 cycles you may perform n operations. So, this is the operation and the advantage of vector processors ok. So, just a high overview high level overview of vector processor. So, vector instructions access memory with known pattern what I am saying is you are giving a single instruction uh, for a set of processors. So, the organizing the instructions and the data is very very important. So, vector of data needs to be in a contiguous space ok. So, the memory configuration for a vector processor needs to be set up then only the accessing and uh, the operations may be uh, done with a higher performance. So, all of you are aware of interleaved memory where you have even our simple D dim package of DRAM this multiple chips will be there and then now we have data accessing from all the chips. So, we are interleaving multiple banks of memory. 
so that they all operate in parallel the address resolution you know uh, resolving the address and then getting the data out all a bands in the memory will be working on in parallel so you will get a performance benefit so especially in a better processor we need data multiple data to be fed to the processors so we need a interleaved memory to feed the processor with more data, you know faster data and uh, the memory latency is amortized over multiple elements because we are accessing multiple elements at the same time data is accessed from memory put in order into large set of registers and one more uh, thing we need to remember is i told you that add unit the alu may be having multiple add units will be there okay okay multiple add units uh, arithmetic units but if they need to get two parameters each then we need that many registers okay so a better processor will have more registers in the system okay it also has more processing elements the uh, multiplication or arithmetic units as well as more registers so that the operands can be kept in the in them and they can be accessed by multiple elements you know processing elements simultaneously okay and then they operate on the element one by one and the processor write the results back into memory so this reduces the branch and branch problem because we are operating you now we are getting results of multiple data operations and then there are fewer instructions uh, because one instruction itself you know does multiple day, uh, operations so there will be fewer instruction fetches so these are the advantages of vector architecture and then as some other advantages a single vector instruction which is a great deal of work instruction fetch and decode bandwidth needed is needed is dynamically reduced because see when is the bandwidth is more uh, is required suppose the memory is not able to feed okay the speed at which the processor wants okay now when i tell you that one instruction goes in and then multiple elements are there in the cpu they work on the data in parallel and then i am telling you that the data elements are arranged in a very you know unique memory interleaved memory and then they can feed the cpu the instruction Uh, fetch need not be so fast. You know the, this uh, speed of the memory need not be very fast because we are getting multiple operations done at the same time with the single instruction. So the, it is dramatically the instruction fetch and decode bandwidth is reduced. Results computed by various elements in a in a vector are independent of each other. One more thing we should remember is in a matrix multiplication, the multiplication done by multiple elements. What you see, they all independent elements there we add them so there is no data dependency among them that means we don't have to wait for this operation to be completed before this can start they can all they all can start in parallel so the data dependency or the data hazards what we have seen okay in the uniprocess systems are reduced so still there will be a data hazard between vectors but within the vector there is no data hazard so it is power efficient because reduction in instruction bandwidth and the data hazard checking so if you need to check the data hazard on every arithmetic operation that you perform then there must be some digital circuits kept in the system but which will consume power but that is reduced so so we get advantage of power efficiency because of the less reduced instruction bandwidth and then uh, reduced data hazard verification while running the code fine so this is a very quick recap of what what is vector processor and what is a samd architecture so vector processor in a nutshell falls under samd that is single instruction multiple data uh, architecture and it works on it gets a single instruction but it works on multiple processing elements are there and they work on multiple data and produce multiple results okay so it's a parallel architecture because more elements are there in parallel okay Are running in parallel. Okay, now let us see a VFP architecture. VFP is your vector floating point architecture. Now the vector floating point processor architecture is a co-processor extension to the ARM architecture. So now you should remember all that I mentioned about co-processors. Okay, so VFP is nothing but a co-processor. So this is data bus. Okay, memory. this is address bus okay so what is connected the data bus is connected and then if you recall let me just quickly recall uh, the ncpi coprocessor instruction and then there are two 
this is the one input coming from ARM, this is the two you know CPA, CPB if you remember coprocessor accent and coprocessor busy signal. So all this handshake and then there is you no know, restriction that this cannot drive the address bus but it can take the data in and then it has got its own instruction pipeline which will be in sync with the pipeline in the ARM all that should come in your mind ok. When I am talking about VFP it is basically a coprocessor with using a CPID ok let me just tell you now itself CPID 10 it is not 16 CPID 10 and 11 there is a single precision floating point and this is a double precision floating point. So, it uses the CPID of 10 and 11 these are all reserved ok. So, it is not you know um, it is a standard that you know it is used by vector floating point processor that uh, I do not call it as a reserve because the 8 to 11 if I remember I think uh, they are all um, given for user level vector you know floating point processor or any other coprocessor that you can design. So, the coprocessor ID can be anything but the 10 and 11 are used for by this vector processor which comes along with the ARM SOC ok ARM uh, IP. So, it works with ARM on VFP so uh, as a coprocessor. So, you should remember all the instructions that it can operate on and uh, so, basically all the operations done by vector floating point processor is done through a coprocessor instruction ok. So, please remember this all of them what I mentioned in the earlier class. Um, it provides single precision as well as double precision. So, this also you should know single precision is a 32 bit floating point representation and double precision is a 64 bit representation IEEE 754 standard. So, it can work on any of them. So, based on the type of the IBFP we have. So, just now I introduce you vectors to vectors. So, BFP has 8 elements ok uh, that can be uh, done in parallel see this is this number cannot be arbitrary because it is tied to the see vector length when I say vector of data it can a processor can operate on ok. I am saying that 0 to 7 that means 8 elements can be there the when I say that it can work on 8 set of data in parallel that means that many processing elements should be in the system the VFP that has been designed ok VFP need to have that many processing elements to process the multiple data elements in parallel. So, this 8 is fixed that means it can work on either 8 single precision operations or 4 double precision ok because basically uh, for the double precision is a 64 bit data and this is a 32 bit is a double. So, the processing elements are uh, no operating in a in parallel. So, so please remember this VFP can work on vector of data it does not mean that it can not work on a scalar data what I mean the scalar data and vector data means scalar data means maybe a single register operating on a single you uh, know R2 and R3 and then putting the result in R1 it is a scalar data ok. When I say vector data it is a set of registers which are identified ok and it works on that and then set of in a in another set of registers the results are written in ok. So, this is the vector of data. So, vector of data means the data is has to be stored in some intermediate registers. So, the registers are used for that purpose and then the vector processor operates on those vector of data and then results also should be a vector of data because if it is operating on two vector operation uh, two vector two vectors and then it is a vector operation then it will result a result in a vector of data coming out. So, we need to identify the set of registers for where this result should be stored into. So, so most arithmetic instructions can be used on these vectors most arithmetic ok and allowing both single and allowing single precision you know single instruction as well as SAMD parallelism. So, it is actually single instruction SAMD parallelism means it is a single instruction is operating on multiple data. So, the vector of data ok. So, further the floating point load and store instruction have multiple register forms. So, even the arm has multiple register form LDM and STM which you have heard about. So, floating point also supports floating point processor also can load a data from my memory multiple words can be 
copied from memory to registers in the floating point processor or it could be the other way. So, the registers could be saved into memory ok, multiple data transactions can happen ok. Now, I told you that VFP has a double precision support also. So, that is indicated by the naming convention D in it. So, if suppose by you know if you come across a VFP V version 1 D that means that it has got a double precision support also. So, whenever there is a double precision support implicitly the single precision support is also supported ok. You cannot say a processor with only double precision and not supporting a single precision. So, but the other way around is true possible means if it is x x d that means only a single precision is supported. So, what happens is when we support when the process supports both d and single precision and double precision that means there is a complex circuitry in the system. So, to perform this operations whereas, if it has single precision data the because the data width is lesser than the uh, processing elements complexity also comes down ok that is very natural. By default double precision support is also present ok. Now, what is the internal organization of the VFP processor? As I told you VFP is connected to the data bus where ARM is also connected to ok. So, VFP cannot exist alone it is a co processor please keep in mind you cannot have a system with only VFP and write some code for it no it there should be a ARM in it ok and then this co processor can be an add on to that ok and then with the help of ARM co processor can do its job ok. So, the data bus is common for both getting a data from memory as well as instructions also from memory. So, if it is an instruction it is fetched by this instruction issuer which which tracks the pipeline of FPU as and then keeps track of ARM's pipeline so that they are in sync and then based on the instruction if it is a LDM or SDM ok. Then it activates this load store unit so that the addresses will be generated by ARM and then the data coming from the data bus from the memory can be either transferred into the register or it can be copied back to memory. So, this unit takes care of interaction interacting with the memory unit ok and then these two or three signals you you should be by now you should be concerned with that this is the NCPI and these two are CPA and CPB ok which is going to the ARM processor this is a handshake with the ARM processor this is a co processor interface. One thing what we should see from here is the arithmetic unit and register banks are connected like this what does it mean? I told you that a vector processor need to have more register. So, I will show you in a short while you know how many registers are there in the vector processor, but if suppose you no know, I tell you that there are some more registers we can have a set of registers getting loaded from the memory while a set of registers are operated on using the arithmetic unit. So, these two can happen in parallel ok and similar to ARM processor may be the data is copied and then you know from the registers and uh, most of the operations in the vector processor especially multiplication division ok uh, and then square root computation all those especially these two takes more cycles to you know the execute. So, while this is being executed ok if there is a pipeline of instruction I told you in the last class that FIFO of instructions can be in the system in the coprocessor. So, if there is a FIFO of instruction then already one division is instruction has come and then it is being handled by this arithmetic unit and then there can be a load or LDM or STM can happen in parallel because this can do that job ok. So, parallelism is possible because of the number of registers that are supported in the system and then the way it is organized. So, the you know as this is shown the register bank has got more read and the right post and they can because of number of registers are more one set of registers can be getting loaded from the memory while the other set of registers are operated upon with the you know by the arithmetic unit. So, they all can happen in parallel ok.
within the VFP. Apart from this parallelism within VFP, ARM is also executing some instruction. Okay, once it hands over the CDP instruction, that is core process data processing instruction, like MUL or add whatever, it goes ahead with the ARM instruction. So it is also executing some control instruction in parallel. So there is a lot of parallelism now you see, and within this, when they have a vector of data, the vector of data is also doing a parallel of parallel operation not only the parallelism between these two within the vector there is a multiple data elements are getting operated on so there is a parallelism here too so you can imagine a parallel execution between arm and coprocessor and within coprocessor the load element and the arithmetic unit are running in parallel and then within the arithmetic unit a vector of data is getting operated on you know maximum i told you eight single precision operations can happen in parallel so there is so much of parallelism now in the same clock cycle so much of operation getting done. So all these things keep in mind at the back of your uh, while reading this back of your mind keep this thing so that you understand that how much of performance improvement you get with this kind of advancement in the architecture. So the lower show end operates concurrently which I already told you so and then the arithmetic units can work on the previously loaded operands. Hardware interlocks protect against data hazard. So that I told you that between two vectors there can be a data hazard, but not within the vector, right? So there are some hardware interlocks. That means suppose there are two vector operations, and then if suppose I I know I'll give you an example. Add is uh, add two vectors. Okay, uh, I'll give you exact syntax later. Okay, in the class, you know, two vectors are getting operated, and then you say mul is also getting done. Now this vector may be is used here as a multi you know one of the operands okay between two vectors there can be a um, dependency so the data hazard can happen so the operands which are there in two instructions which are within the VFP which are getting operated you can see that maybe S3 is in both the places then it can, this has to write into the register first and then this has to take. So the operand needs to come after the completion of this then only this operation can start up. So that kind of a data hazard dependencies can be caught with the hardware interlocks in the system. So there is a support for identifying those kind of data hazards ok. Now let us see what is the support code. So again I have to give you a little bit of background ok again similar diagram I am uh, ARM and a VFP. Now I will not talk about uh, just a coprocessor. It's a VFP coprocessor. Now, if you recall, IEEE 754, the floating point process, process you know, floating point format, it has got lots of exceptions. You know, you have seen that. You no know, zero by zero. Okay, infinity by infinity. There are so many kind of operations which can result into some exceptions. Okay, there could be a data about, or it could be a, an error, or there may be a possibility that the number, the result that you are getting, is going below the normalized value. You know, you are getting a very low value. Okay, this is 0, 0.0. Okay, and then you are getting a result which is very low, and then it has to be either written as, you no, know, minus zero or plus zero. Okay, so that decision has to be taken. So this kind of data, be you know, dependent exceptions are multiple possible with a you know with a floating point arithmetic. So when such things happen how does the vector floating point processor can start you know, give a control to exception handler. I have to give you a little bit of background because um, it will be a difficult if you do not have this in the back of your mind ok. Now assume there is some floating point operation which was done by the processor ok let me choose another color ok. Now this has done a job ok some floating point addition operation or maybe a division ok let me call you know, floating point division it did and then they divide by 0 as capital ok divide by 0 ok. So any number you know some uh, n divided by 0 has happened. So this has to be handled in a separate way it depends on the application. So now 
see who executed this instruction if the instruction was done by the vector process floating point processor, but it has it has encountered an error condition. Now it should take you no know, it should uh, bring the uh, whatever has happened into the vector processor it should bring it to the notice of ARM ok. So exception handler how does it work ok you know that vector table is there inter bracket table which is in the memory ok suppose this is a memory in inter bracket table is there and then maybe a, a undefined exception undefined instruction ok undefined exception has to be created generated. Now that needs to be signaled to the processor so that whatever the ARM processor is currently doing it stops that and then gets the control to the interpreted table where undefined instruction in no instruction vector is picked up and then the handler which is stored in the memory is executed. So something happening here needs to generate an exception and that needs to be um, controlled or it needs to be processed by the ARM processor. So please remember VFP or any other coprocessor in the system do not they do not have their own exception handling capability. So they need to be any exception handler specific to the particular coprocessor needs to be integrated into the ARM's coprocessor uh, sorry ARM's uh, exception handlers and then based on which coprocessor or which instruction has passed the uh, exception accordingly the handler can act on it. Now how you may wonder ok instruction handler is called ok and then you if you recall while the instruction handler is called it will also know which instruction has caused it because see the instruction is getting executed and then some other instruction is there. So you have to track back trace which instruction has caused the hand you know um, exception and then process on that. So specific to the particular coprocessor handling has to be done. So the job of the support code is to provide that capabilities ok. Whoever is supplying the VSP the vector floating point coprocessor will also provide the support code for it the exception handlers and then the system software developer ok while developing the software for this whole SOC will integrate those exception handlers which has been given by the VFP vendor into their application and then build the system ok. So that is how it works. So that software component is called a support code the support code provides a feature of IEEE compliance that are not supported by the hardware. So basically if you can see that the support code is a software because it has to be executed as a part of exception handling. So if a VSP processor in its own hardware if it cannot take a specific exception condition in the hardware it may be reason may be that it is very complex to implement in hardware than you know putting it in software or it could be that it is the probability of that particular exception happening is so less that we do not want to increase the footprint of the processor with a more complexity or no it will be very power hungry also if that there is a system there. But those occasional things can be handled using software without any performance uh, drawback if the application warrants that then that particular handling of those things can be given to software or a hardware. So it is actually a implementation choice whether a handling of particular thing has to be done by hardware or software, but if it has to be done by the software it has to be provided by the VFP vendor as a support code which is called sub architecture ok. So the definition of the interface between vector floating point processor hardware and the support code is known as the sub architecture. So implementation ok this is the this is the definition of support code what I mean by support code and then I said told you earlier CP 10 and 11 are normally used for VFP coprocessor one is for single precision arithmetic and another for double precision. In general this is a single precision and CP 11 for double precision. So what I mean by that 
suppose if you are in you no know, interested in share you know giving a set of data the arm core okay when i say you mean the arm is giving a coprocessor instruction to the vfp it may say that cp10 okay uh, i think 8 to some number i think 11 i think cp id will be put right in the instruction uh, format so you the arm processor or the assembler or the you no know, the compiler generates the code for the cp id based on whether a single precision operation has to be done or a double precision operation has to be done by the vfp okay so based on that the particular coprocessor instruction will be generated and the vfp will you no know, look at the value of cp id and then it comes to know whether they supposed to do a single precision or double precision operation okay let us see now what are the applications that will be benefited by the vfp the vector floating point processor image processing applications so let me give an example what is scaling suppose you have a cube okay in a in a graphics uh, world okay so you want to scale it to the bigger size okay so what is being done here in a typical um, image processing every pixel suppose you no know, this is occupying a less number of you no know, pixels and then this is getting a enlarged because of scaling maybe scaling by two factor now whatever images are here are you no know, represented as two bits here and two pixels and then they are expanded so to do the scaling operation a scalar vector has to be multiplied with the pixels in the system okay this is a complex graphics is not very simple but when you want to do a scaling operation it's actually a multiple part of the images are handled and then they are they can be done in parallel okay image processing actually gives you a lots of a scope for parallelism because what you are working on this image you no know, the scheme scheme logic can be applied on this part of the image both can happen in parallel because there is no dependency among these two in terms of scaling you know in particular this gets expanded to this part and the other part will get expanded to this part so basically these two part of the image can be acted on in parallel so it is a good candidate for a vector processor okay because multiple data the same scaling factor is a single instruction okay so that's a, a correct fit for a operation in a 2d 3d transformation suppose you want to transfer a 2d image to a 3d then you have to give the depth perspective to them or one more um, no um, dimension has to be added so these kind of things can be graphics or image processing are the good candidate for smd or floating point operation and font generation different kinds of fonts may be converting from one kind of font to the other one okay uh, can be done digital filters there is a serial processing algorithm which operates on parallel data okay and it is all if you see they are all uh, you know if you want a good precision of data it has to be done in floating point okay that is a common thing you can't achieve the same kinds of uh, you know perfection in the image generation if you use a integer data format so you have to have a floating point format so that the images quality and the um uh, the quality of uh, digital filters that are performed as of on signal processing they will also be you know producing a good result when you operate on floating point uh, number system so this is the best better choice for performing these jobs so any scientific application that need floating point operation will be a uh, the vfp is a right choice okay now we have a enough of good background and why we need a vfp how it is implemented how they are connected to arm and okay how they handle some exceptions also i gave you but now we will see inside of vfp what is inside of it so basically first thing what you should want to learn about any processor is its own register so it has got 32 general purpose registers okay if you recall in the arm there were 16 general purpose registers okay apart from bank registers there were 16 r0 to r15 correct so maybe if you add all the bank registers and the spsr and the cpsr it was coming closer to this 
but here in vector processor we have a 32 general purpose registers I as I told you vector processor are working on vector of data so they need more registers so this is a natural choice is to have more registers in them and the registers can store either single precision or a, a 32 bit integer in them see one thing you should remember when you have a 32 bit register this is a bit pattern ok. So, either we can store a floating point value or an integer ok signed integer or un, unsigned here because whether you are storing a floating point or integer depends on how you interpret this bit pattern in this register ok. There is nothing special about it ok, how do you interpret the numbers? How the how this now ones and zeros in the 32 bit, 32 bit values are interpreted depends on what kind of value you keep it in the register. But for a register to store some 32 bit value, or it's not only you know restricted to register, even a memory, it can store the bit pattern in the memory. How you interpret depends on what you know about this data, whether it's a floating point data or inter, you know integer data, you interpret it that way. So this VFP registers are not aware ok, whether it is storing a floating point value or integer value. Now, there is a confusion, now how will I know what is being stored there and how do I operate on it. So, who decides it? It is decided by the instruction, please remember as an application developer if you are writing assembly code you are writing the instructions and you are moving the data into the registers because you are only writing the LDM instruction from the memory. So, as a programmer you are supposed to know what data you are moving into the registers and what instructions you are giving to operate on those registers. Suppose if you move integer values from memory you can you know execute some integer arithmetic on it or you can even you know why do you want to do a integer arithmetic in the VFP registers you can as well do it in ARM processor. So, what I am saying is you can interpret it in a different way and you can convert this integer to floating point and then operate on it internally in the VFP because in input may be an integer and then you do a conversion to the floating point value and then operate on it inside the floating point processor. So, these kind of thing can be done using this register and you can move the values of you know the uh, either an integer or a floating point into this register freely. The processor does not understand or does not relate see it understands the floating point para, uh, format, but it does not know whether a particular register is holding an integer value or a floating point value that is only the instructions know. So, based on the instruction if suppose instruction says this is the register R 0 and this is you know I am talking about BFP or, or you know maybe S 0 and S 1 this is a convention followed in the floating point. If I say that these two are single position data and then I operate on a floating floating point addition then this will this bit pattern will be considered as a floating point and this will be considered as a floating point and it will add these two as floating point and write it into some register S4, it will write there in the floating point format. So, that is what I am trying to say here ok. So, D variants of architecture these registers can also be used in pairs. So, now when I say that ok I will show you the register. So, two set of registers one after the other can be considered as a the holding a double precision value ok. So, there are three or more system register this is uh, something to do with the similar to CPSR there are some system registers to configure the floating point processor as well as to find out what is the flags coming out of the operation of floating point those things are managed by some system registers in the system in the floating point processor this is the status and control registers ok. Now, this is the register file, so S0 to S31 ok, how many 32 registers. So, I told you this is a single precision that means each register here is a 32 bit wide ok. Now, what is this double precision is a 64 bit wide data register, so it combines S0 and S1 element as a D0. So, if you are operating on if you say I am operating on a is a double add suppose if I uh, if I have a floating point operation, but it is a double precision arithmetic and then I say that D 0 comma D 1 
parameter and then the 3 is a you know um, result has to be written. So, it will combine these two registers and access them as a single element as a D0 and then D1 and write the result into F3 D3. So, this is how the register files are con you know overlapped with each other. So, please remember this is a physically there is only one there is no no separate physical registers like this and this only 32 registers are there whether you are considering it as a double position or not depends on how you interpret these values whether you are taking them all together as a double position or you are treating this one single element as a single position depends on the operation. So, again whether it has to be interpreted as a single uh, no sorry uh, you know combined as a data double position data or it has to be treated as a single uh, single position data depends on the instruction ok. As such registers do not have the information whether they are holding either an integer value or is it holding a double position value or it is a single position value the registers do not have any indication associated with them ok. One more important thing that I want to explain here that is called register banks it is different from bank register that we saw in ARM ok. So, here the register banks you have a 32 registers in it and then if we treat them as single position registers they are all listed like this ok. There are 8, eight single position registers here, 8 here, 8 here, 8 here. Now, these banks are called bank 0 this set of registers are called bank 0, this is called bank 1 and bank 2 and bank 3. Now, what is this arrow indicating ok, it is not that these values are all rotated and then they go into the you know this content goes into this and this content goes into this it is not that ok. Uh, please you know you might have seen those kinds of arrows for rotating bits within the register, but here what it means is I told you that BFP is a vector processor right it works on vectors. Suppose if I give an instruction ok f add hmm, I give an example ok yes 8 comma yes sorry let me erase it ok yes 16 and yes 24 ok what does it mean I gave these registers here ok that is all. Now, what I am I trying to do I am adding these two and then result I am putting it here ok assume this. Now, there is a another you know apart from looking at this I mentioned about FPSCR ok I think status and control register it has got two fields ok. Let me talk about length field LEN field this is a 3 bit pad 3, 3 bits are reserved for LEN ok. Assume this LEN bit in the FCSR register ok there is only one single register in the VFP and it has a value 101 what does it mean it is a 4 plus 1 5 if it has a value like this ok 5 then when you do a you know uh, if add yes ok actually it is a convention is that you know, this is the instruction ok. When you perform this arithmetic and then you are mentioning these registers and the instruction while this instruction is being executed by the VFP please remember this instruction is executed by VFP it looks at this bit pattern in the FPSR it sees that it is it is having because this one went up I wrote 1 0 1 here it sees that there is a 5 then it adds 1 to this value ok and it assumes that you are interested in performing not a single scalar operation you are not interested in just adding x 16 plus x 24 and writing into s 8 you are interested in performing a set of 6 operations vector operations what does it mean you want to do this and then you want to add these two elements and write into this 
and you want to add these two elements and write into this like this goes on up to this ok. So, the starting point is considered to be these registers ok got it. So, if suppose if I tell instead of S8 ok if I write an instruction assuming that the FPS or values are same ok these values are same I write an instruction saying that S11 comma S19 comma S27 this value happens to be the same that means 6 operation, but you are starting from S11 that means this register S19 ok and S27. So, from starting from this register go down if you encounter this end of this go up and pick the remaining operands. So, up to what time up to 6. So, it will do this, it will do set of this, you know, S27 and 19 will be added and put in S7, and these two will be done and put in this. So, how many are done? 5 are done. So, one more will be done by doing taking these 3 in the set. So, that is what is called bank registers and how it operates on the bank. And now, let me erase this. Now, it is not that by chance I picked only these 3, ok. This bank remember that it cannot be any register from this bank cannot be taken as an operand or a destination for a better arithmetic ok. You can do better arithmetic within these three banks, but you we cannot do from this bank. Now, you may wonder what is the use of this that you no know, are we wasting one set of bank of register register for this no. I will give you some examples where we want to do a scalar operation then implicitly this bank is used for that purpose. So, these instructions these registers are used for scalar operations ok and these set of registers in the these banks can be used for scalar as well as vector operations. What I mean by scalar operation only no operating on one register and another register and putting the result back. In a vector operation, we go into set of registers and operate on, on them. So, if you want to perform a vector operation, we can take this three bank registers, or if you want to do only scalar operation, this bank register is used. So, that is the indication. So, register file is divided into four banks, ok, eight registers in each bank. And please remember, you can do a floating point vector operation using a single position or double position. So, if you, if you do double position, you can have maximum four data elements can be double position can be picked up from the vector, the vector length can be maximum of 4 if it is a double position operation in the vector length could be a maximum of 6 uh, sorry 8 in a single position operation, but it could be less than that no issues, but maximum it could be 8 because you cannot have a more than 8 vectors ok at a time. Otherwise you have to copy from memory and then perform it I will show you an example where that kind of operation will be done in the end of the, the class. CDP instruction access the banks in a circular manner, but not closed store instruction that is very very important difference ok. Only CDP that means what all the add multiply square root or whatever any arithmetic operations or any data processing on operations only act these registers they only treat them as a bank of registers, because the vector operation what I showed you ok they combine and then they operate you know give you a vector of data I told you that right. So, they operate on the vector of data only during the arithmetic operation not during the memory access. So, memory access treats these registers as a set of sequential set of registers starting from S0 to S31 ok or it treats them as D0 to D15 ok double precision. So, any suppose if you want to copy uh, data from memory into the register you can based on the length of the copying you want to perform and then what is the starting registers you are giving up to the end it will go it will not wrap around please remember loading or storing you know 
load store instructions do not wrap around. They perform operation from sorting from a lower register number to a higher register number. You get the same as our ARM processor. Okay, so they don't treat this banks of registers. Okay, as a bank in circular manner. They don't treat them or access them in a circular manner. Vector length is decided by the length field in FTS. I mentioned that to you, and then the the destination is a bank zero. So another difference is if the destination register happens to be a bank zero irrespective of what is the value in length field it will treat it as a scalar operation I will give you an example ok. Suppose you have a f add s ok hmm? you say s 0 comma s 8 comma s 16 what does it mean s 8 and s 16 is added ok and then put into s 0. Now this destination register ok FD, FD is a floating point destination register happens to be from a bank 0 right is it S0 ok sorry is not very clear let me write it. Let me write it for a change clear handwriting is 0 now what happens. Once the FP, VFP looks at this as a 0 it will not assume that ok you want to perform some more operation accessing after this S9 then S10 and then S17 and S18 go on and then perform this it will not do it though length field says maybe 6 it will not do a 6 vector operation it will only perform a scalar operation ok that is what is a what is conveyed in the last bullet of this slide. If the destination is a bank 0 register the operation is a scalar only regardless of the value in length field. I hope this is clear to you ok. So, this is very critical and you should understand this when I show you an example you will be able to appreciate it ok. Let us go little faster here loading floating point values into registers to memory and storing floating point values in register to memory there are these instructions supported ok. And then some of these instructions allow multiple register values also ok LDM and similar to LDM such instructions can be used to load or store set vectors of short vectors of floating point value. Transfer 32 bit values directly from VFP to ARM ok register transfer is also there if you remember MCR and MRC instruction ok these are all the coprocessor register transfer instruction coprocessors to ARM register and then register to ARM register to coprocessor register. So, this instruction MRC and MCR instructions are also supported by VFP because it is a VFP is a coprocessor. So, all the coprocessor instructions are supported by VFP transfer 32 bit value directly from VFP system registers to ARM general purpose registers ok and then it can also do a multiple operations ok different kinds of operations on either a vector of data or a single floating point scalar values ok. So, single floating point values are called scalar uh, set of vectors are you know data elements are called vectors ok that is a and then copy a floating point value between registers. So, between the register itself in the VFP within the VFP you can copy them while copying we can do a sign bit can be you know inverted that means if you want to convert a minus negative value while copying to another register suppose S0 to S1 you are copying ok and then you want to make it minus to plus that is a possibility ok you can invert sorry this one is not here ok S0 to S1 you are transferring, but while transferring you want to convert you know you invert the in, in sign bit of this that is also possible. All these instructions also can be used in short vectors, so you can perform these operations on vector of data also perform combined multiply accumulate. So, you want to do a multiplication of two vectors and then add to the result ok normally it will be kept in another register and then it will be put here. So, MAC operation you know is a very popular multiply accumulate operation is very popular signal processing instruction which are also supported by VFP. Conversions between single precision to get and data precision and double precision values as well as and with uh, no twos complement to sign with unsigned to signed also you can do. But you have to remember that if you are converting an a huge unsigned value sometimes it may not fit into the 2 bit value ok because it only represents half of the unsigned value because sign bit is coming there. 
compare floating point values in register with each other okay with a zero okay those compare operations are also there now i touched upon exceptions earlier let me give you uh, overview invalid operation this is an exception which happens when you do this kind of operation okay zero by zero it may generate a not a number the result will be put as a norm suppose see what i mean by this is suppose you are dividing s0 by s1 and you want to write the value into s3 s3 is what single position register now you have mentioned that you want to do a divide operation but if suppose if it had a plus 0 here and then if this was also having a plus 0 now this is dividing a 0 by 0 which is a not a valid condition so there are two possibilities one is it generates an exception so it goes to arm and then arm generates an exception undefined exception and then the exception handler the support code handles it or you say that in S3 write quite nan. So quite nan is what this is a one representation a specific representation to say that I do not want to generate an exception I want to suppress it by filling in the value with a quite nan that means what this is a, a pattern which is not a correct floating point value but this is a not a number. It is not actually holding a floating point uh, value, but it is the indication. So whenever this bit pattern is seen by the floating point processor or your application, you should act on it accordingly. So that kind of uh, situation, the we can have a, a quite nine. Okay, can be returned. So it is all. You know, I typically says that either you do this or you do this. So. So when we have a VFP with a support code you can decide whether an exception has to be given or you just fill the if suppose you get this kind of a division generate a quiet man and then go, go ahead and execute the next instruction. So division by 0 you know you can either two options are there suppose you are positive value ok you are dividing it by 0 you can say that there is a positive infinity is representation is there that you can generate and then go ahead with the execution or you generate an exception. So there are two possibilities. So the, these are the things defined by the IEEE 754. In next step suppose you are not able to represent a value accurately then you can round it off because maximum you have a 23 bit of fractional part. So if you are exceeding that you know uh, limit then we can round it off ok and then store that in the floating point representation. So if whenever you round off you say that and create an exception so that if suppose the application developer wants to catch this kind of a scenario it can generate an exception. And then what are the other different kind of uh, exception overflow exception this occurs whenever you are adding a huge number of floating point values either it goes into plus infinity ok the addition results in the plus infinity or it is minus infinity ok. So in that kind of situation either you can fill up with this value and then suppress it or you generate an exception it based on the application developers uh, what he wants to do. Now under flow so let me again 0, 0.0 it is it was explained in the last class anyway I will come back I and explain here see there is a, a possibility that under flow can happen that means you are not able to express this smaller value which you are getting it in the normalized notation ok if you recall when you are not able to represent in the normalized rotation which is 1.0 into that 2 power e correct and then you know this is f you know 2 power f yeah, 1.f ok floating uh, the fractional part. Now when you are not able to use it in the normalized form you can always say that it is a denormalized rotation and then there is a separate notation for that that means the you know exception uh, sorry exponential portion can be 0 and then uh, fractional portion can be a non zero. So this can be used if you want to use a sign bit. So uh, you want to have a denormalized number that means what you are extending the limit of smaller number to a denormalized value. So you can still extend it either this way positive side or negative side you can extend it into this format. So that can be decided based on a choice when an underflow happens. Now if it is too small to be represented in a normalized form it can be either denormalized or it can be made as a plus or minus 0 ok.
either you can say that it is closer to this and leave it or you use a near denormalized rotation for that ok. Now exception handling how do you do it there are two ways untrapped that means you do not want to trap it so you this this causes you know cumulative flag in the FPSR because of you know untrapped this causes the appropriate cumulative flag in the FPSR to set the set one. So, if suppose you have you do not want to generate a trap then we can the QC flag can be set to indicate that there was a condition which you know exceeded the limit, but I because I do not want to generate a trap I am just indicating it by setting this flag ok that is the internal handling any result register of the exception generating instruction to be set to, to the result value specified by the standard. So, as I told you suppose you are the number what you are getting is not you get 0 is here the number what you are getting after the division it becomes too small to be represented you can decide to put it as a plus 0 or minus 0 from based on where the result is coming from which direction. So, that specific value can be loaded or you can make it as minus infinity and plus infinity you can make this values as a result instead of generating an uh, exception. So, untrapped is there that means you do not want to generate an exception you either do this or you set the values according to the standard. If you want if it is a trap you want to generate trap then this is selected by setting the appropriate flag and then exception happens and then the support code will get executed and who calls the exception arm calls the exception. So, this is how the web floating point processor handles the exceptions very good support code I already explained to you a complete implementation of VAP architecture this is due to existence of trapped floating point exception basically support code comes only when there are exception and which needs to be trapped that means you want to generate an exception. So, the, the support code is typically entered through arm undefined instruction I told you vector when the VAP hardware does not respond to VAP instruction. So, it could be possible that when when the operation is not possible to be performed then the vector processor can say that I do not want to you know take this instruction. So, it will not respond back with the busy signal then the exception can be generated or it could happen later also after the execution also. Handles can be used for rare conditions ok uh, and wherever the operations cannot be implemented in hardware the exception handling can be done. So, the division of labor between hardware or software is a implementation dependent decision ok. So, if there is no hard and fast rule that it needs to be done in one way and then I am just saying that there is a possibility of this VFP causing an interrupt latency to the ARM processor. So, you should be aware of that because ARM is executing in and the VFP is also there ok. If you recall uh, ok suppose there is a coprocessor load instruction ok load instruction load multiple instruction ok. What happens the memory is there coprocessor is loading the value from memory into its own register. So, if you are you, you are you are clear now 32 single precision registers are there. So, it can decide to you know transfer 32 into 4 bytes of data from memory in one go. Now, this coprocessor load instruction has to be done with the help of ARM because ARM is generating the address and then the data comes here. So, during this time there is a possibility of an interrupt happening IRQ happening or FIQ happening ok. In that case what happens this existence of VFP because of 32 bytes of 32 into 4 bytes of data is being transferred this interrupt latency is coming. So, do not think that coprocessor is anyway is a, you know it is running in parallel. So, it is not going to impact the performance of ARM we cannot assume that ok. So, there is a tie up between them because of this existence of this a particular instruction is getting executed the ARM interrupt latency may increase. So, when as a system designer we need to keep all this in mind before deciding on what kind of instruction you will allow and uh, what kind of interrupt latency you can expect from your system. So, and then other than that this undefined instruction trap what I said that you know your undefined instruction trap is generated by the vector processor and then arm is executing it. Now, because 
when the undefined instruction exception is create you know generated it causes irq to be disabled okay that is a default behavior if if we don't enable them internally i told you one exception handling also where interrupts can be enabled internally inside the handler if we don't enable them then this is going to delay the IR, irq handling the interrupt latency of irq will be delayed because of this so that you should keep in mind so use of vrp in a system therefore increases worst case irq latency considerably it is possible to reduce this irq latency penalty by explicitly re enabling interrupts okay we have to re enable the interrupts into inside the handler to make sure that the interrupt latency is reduced so though faqs are not disabled by entry to the undefined instruction handler it is recommended that faq handlers themselves should not use vrp okay what i mean by here faq interrupt can be you know they are not disabled even if it is undefined instruction handling of we a vector processor instruction is running during that time faq interrupt is happening then it will be serviced because we are not disabling the faq inside the default it is not disabled but if faq handler itself is using the vfp then it is going to cause some delay it may cause a delay because if this then you know instruction which is being used inside the handler generates a vector processor you know exception undefined instruction exception then it is going to further delay the execution so need to take care that the faq handlers do not use any vfp instruction please remember vfp instructions can be used anywhere okay and uh, in that case we have to some restriction should be there that handlers do not use those instructions to improve the interrupt latency of the system okay now how does the vfp and arm interact i told you that vfp load store instructions are allowed to produce data abort so vfp implementation are able to cope with the data abort and as explained earlier arm takes care of generating the address all this you know vfp decides the number of words transferred by the multiple load store instruction i am just summarizing it which you saw it in the coprocessor also that load store multiple are possible with vfp also in any coprocessor also now and then what are the arm instruction now you know that these are the coprocessor instruction this this is a data processing instruction this is load store instruction of coprocessor and this is a coprocessor to arm register transfer okay and it uses 10 and 11 and then if conditional code is not uh, met then both vfp as well as arm treat that vector processor as a instruction as a no op so one more important thing i mentioned it in the last class i like not last class in the coprocessor class so see conditional execution is handled by the fpsr the cpsr values in the arm processor that is that cznv flags so the conditional execution is based on these flags okay not based on the vfp flags vfp also has equivalent flag but it is not based on this suppose you want to execute some instruction based on this conditional flag this needs to be transferred to the arm cznv and then it should be performed so there is a provision for that that is called if fm strat instruction what does it do it transfers the floating point status register values into the cpsr register so how do you do it we perform this c to r and r will be r15 now we give that you now the target register is r15 in arm and then we say that fpsr value scr value then what happens is the lower four bits are transferred to the cpsr okay that is how it is done i think i explained this in the previous uh, discussion so we don't have to go into the detail now we are going to conclude this class with one small example which you will love it okay let me explain this now don't get overwhelmed with the instruction and uh, you no know, length of instruction it is going on so big see nothing s is nothing but it's a floating point ldm and stm you recognize it very well okay the load multiple is not ias is not a uh, the government service it is in, in increment after okay it is a stack operation or a multiple data transfer operation is okay it can be used for anything but it's a multiple data transfer operation 
so we want to say that memory you increment it after loading this value whatever the current base pointer is pointing at okay if you recall and then yes is to indicate that this instruction will be modifying the class now this is the base register base register has to be a arm register okay because address generation is done by arm and then the base register is getting incremented based on this condition and then it is a load multiple load multiple is what it is loading into register which register the floating point registers s8 to s15 okay so basically what is happening here a set of eight float values the four byte values are copied from memory to the, the registers in the processor okay inside the floating point processor so so this whole thing is understood and then it generates a, a coprocessor instruction the assembler would have put a coprocessor instruction to give this information to the arm and coprocessor and they work in hand to transfer this value from memory to the coprocessor registers so now what happens in this instruction a base register r2 is used and it is you know written back the incremented address is written back and then it is copying into this set of registers now two set of registers are copied okay let me uh, go to the next one so what happens is you see memory okay if you understand this then you will know how floating point processor works okay vfp i have a vector set of registers okay s8 to s15 okay this is what it belongs to which bank bank 1 bank 0 is a 0 to s7 so that is not used a bank 1 is used and then another bank is used s16 let me change the color okay s16 to s23 this is how many register eight registers are there this is bank 2 okay now it is copied from see arm is here and then two registers r1 r2 are there r1 is pointing some location from that address increment after so this is lower address suppose this is lower address and this is higher address it is incremented and then it is fetched and r2 is pointing to some other location in the memory and that is fetched and this data comes here this data goes here so arm is generating the address and then data is going into the vfp okay it is not coming back to the arm arm processor it is going to the vfp because it is a coprocessor instruction got it okay now what is happening next i think you understood this to instruction now let us see what is this f add as yes 24 okay now yes 24 is coming only yes 24 is coming okay i am sorry i am uh, exceeding this limit of the processor assume that the processor is bigger enough so now yes 24 is here up to yes 31 now this is bank 3 okay now assume the fcsr value okay that is very important that time see when this instruction is to be executed by the floating point processor it looks at the fcsr len field and sees that okay i have a value which happens to be a vector of length 8 okay that means what whatever value is here plus 1 so vector of 8 that means it is supposed to do vector arithmetic what i mean by that S16 starting from S16 and starting from S8, which have the data already you have loaded them with all the data. Okay, you perform the arithmetic like that means what S8 okay is added to S16 okay and written into S24. Now don't stop with that because this is eight seven plus one eight. so eight operations need to be done and in sequence that means s9 will be added to s17 okay and write into s25 
go on like this and then you do a yes 15 okay plus yes 23 and write into yes 31 okay so who does this we are not given any of these register values only this register values are given and it is implicit that if it belongs to the different bank other than bank 0 and the len field says how many elements in a vector operation to be done then that many operations are done. This one instruction performs 8 additions ok remember now let me erase the whole thing no harm you remember this banks now. Now you see I wanted to show you one more example of a scalar operation here again the bank ok there are two banks ok the input branch are S8 to S15 and S24 ok ok into S1 S1 belongs to which bank it belongs S0 to S7 belongs to bank 0. So, if one of the operands especially the RM operands ok this is RM operands RM and RM if you remember in the ARM, ARM days. So, this is a scalar register because it is belongs to the bank 0 ok. Then this instruction though this LEN value is not modified between these two instructions ok it remains to be 8, but it will do a scalar operation. What I mean by scalar means it will not when it sees S1 it picks only the S1 value and then it multiplies with everything in S8 and then writes into S24 that means it will say S8 into S1 write it to the S24 ok and then S9 into S1 same register same register please keep in mind that will be written into S25 and so on up to S31, S31 is written into by S15 into S1. So, that actually you are doing a scaling operation you are performing a scaling operation by fixed amount of S1 scaling you are doing it on 8 data actually speaking it is a vector of data, but one of the element is a scalar. So, that multiplication why multiplication it is a multi instruction if it was an addition everything would have been added by S1 otherwise multiplication. So, this is a one flavor of a another instruction I just wanted to show you that a VFP instruction can be written this way. Now, what happens ok we have done some job inside inside the VFP unless this value what is computed comes out into memory there is no use of this operation right. Then only once it comes into memory maybe ARM can do something with that and then can perform something on it. So, you have to get out that value what is there in the internal registers to the memory. So, that is the STM store memory store in the values from register to memory and the results are in S24 because this this is the register bank which is holding the register. So, you have picked up all the 8 registers and then R0 is pointing to another location in memory where it is copied to. So, that is done and then now I am showing you one more subtract R3 suppose R3 is having a count of 8 close that means suppose you have ok um, multiple sets of values it is not only 8 you have some 80 values ok that means a set of 80 values in another the R, R1 was pointing in one address and then R2 is pointing to another set of values ok. Both of them are having 8 floating point values single position ok uh, 4 bytes each. Now, we have performed 8, 8 data we have taken from the memory and then we have multiplied and we scaled and then wrote it into another location which is pointed by R0 we have stored the 8 values. 8 set of values. Now, you want to take up next set of 8 values from here and there 
and then perform the operation and write into next set of results. So, how many times you will do R3 will be the count will be initialized with the 10. So, you perform 10 times this ok. So, because the registers are limited to only 32 you cannot have infinite registers in the processor, but you are you are interested in performing you know a set of 80 floating point values in stored in two locations and then writing the set of 80 values as a result. So, you can do it in 10 times, but that that control is done by this. Now, where is R3? R3 is an ARM, please remember ARM is having the value the R3, ok. So, it is looping back. The looping back control is done by whom ARM processor because the instruction sequence is controlled by ARM. Now, what happens is after this execution because this subtraction is done in the ARM processor please this instruction is a ARM instruction you have to keep in mind which are floating point instruction VFP instruction which is done by coprocessor and which are ARM instruction. So, when ARM instruction is done the DME is what? branch not equal to that means, this is subtracted by 1 because 1 set of values are done and then if it is not 0 then you want to go back. Now, this instruction is coming again you may wonder what happens if my coprocessor is busy with the previous execution VFP is busy with the previous loop. Now, I am giving another floating now another floating point instruction if you recall ARM processor will send a CPI NCPI then floating point or any other coprocessor will say that I am present or absent and then whether I am busy or not. So, if the coprocessor is busy with the previous loop <coughs> it may not take this instruction or it may not take this instruction because load module might be free it may do that, but it may not take this instruction if it is busy with the previous add or previous mult. So, effectively what will happen ARM processor will block the pipeline of ARM will stall in the execution because the, the coprocessor instruction is not taken up by the VFP ok. So, there is no need to have any other mechanism of waiting the waiting is implicit because that is the condition that ARM processor has put in unless the instruction is accepted by the floating point processor do not go ahead with the execution. So, the ARM processor will not go ahead so it will get blocked because this instruction will be executed faster this also may be done faster because ARM is doing this and is a small integer arithmetic whereas these are all floating point job. So, it will get blocked when multiple iterations of this has to be executed this you should keep in mind how the whole thing is functioning you have to have an understanding of VFP you have to have a you know understanding of how this handshaking is happening, how ARM is generating the instruction you know addresses, how these registers are controlled and which CZNV is used all of these things should come in your mind when you try to understand this flow of instruction ok. So, I hope this explanation was clear to you. So, this is a typical example of how a floating point processor could be used for processing a set of data ok. So, we have come to the end of this class. So, we have covered all of them all of them I am very happy to share this very interesting part of you know information. So, we covered ARM instruction and then now we have covered the coprocessors now we have completed coprocessor now we are going into travel outside the ARM. So, we have come out of the ARM we went into coprocessor now in the subsequent classes we will roam around the SOC ok you know that SOC has ARM processor and coprocessor ok some memory. So, we will visit all the you know friends in the SOC ok as a part of the different units will be covering those things. So, see you in the next session with a some other interesting topic. So, with this we are completing the coprocessor related instruction. So, I you know explained you the coprocessor interfaces and then I explained you coprocessor instructions and then now I showed you how a VFP is implemented using the coprocessor interface ok using the coprocessor instruction how a VFP is implemented before that we saw how floating point is represented. So, now we are covering 
we have covered all of them all the related topics of coprocessor so we are ready to get into some other interesting topic in the in our journey towards arm soc design so i am very happy to share all this information with you these are the reference books okay more often i will be using this okay and uh, this is also being referred and of course arm manuals are used in all the lectures okay thank you very much for your attention i hope this was useful and talk to you in the next class bye bye